Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to uh, the Growing Band Director podcast. Super happy to be here with Jeff and with Scott Kroll. Um, today's episode is called The Rural Band Director, Keys to Success in Building a Rural Band Program. And I just wanted to thank Jim uh, for becoming a Patreon member this this uh, past month uh, and jumping onto our Patreon bandwagon, no pun intended. So, um, Jeff, first, how are you doing? You're looking awfully dapper. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm doing great. It's it's leaf season, so I'm having a great time cleaning up leaves. <laughs> Scott, we've been connecting on Facebook recently, and I've been fascinated with, you've made a comment about growing up in a large population and having being part of big programs and then moving to an area where there were small programs and not feeling um prepared for that right and that that's it, that they're totally different situations so i'm really happy we're getting to connect about this situation because a lot we all have faced different things right good and bad and yeah um so you know i've i i, I teach in a small town you know fifteen thousand people and we've got about 650 or whatever um, and you're smaller than that. Um, and it seems like you've had a lot of success over the years. So I'm hoping we can, we can learn from you. Um, can you start a little bit, just give us, you know, maybe your brief background, uh, sure. music education and, and where we're at. Sure. I, um, started playing, uh, in band and I played the clarinet. I took that up in when I, we were living in Pennsylvania in a town, uh, York, Pennsylvania. And I started in fourth grade. Um, and by the time I hit ninth grade, I had gotten the band book. Uh, I couldn't think about anything else but music that and I didn't know teaching was going to be where I went with that. But I knew definitely I had that band bug and we had probably in the band there. We probably had 110, 120. It was a nice size band. Um, but we moved back down to Panama City and suddenly I found myself in a band with 250 people in it and uh, learned, you know, we had our own ecosystem there. Uh, we, we pretty much, um, stayed within the program and, uh, you know, all our friends were in band. And, uh, so my band director was a guy named Charlie Rogers and he had gone to Troy state university. And, um, so I followed suit. I, I went to Troy state, you know, we always joke there should be a highway from Panama city to Troy and it's mm -hmm. 231, by the way, it's there. So um, there are tons of us Panama City folks that ended up at Troy. And uh, I was very fortunate to um, have three really great mentors there. Uh, Dr. John M. Long, uh, Robert W. Smith, mm -hmm. and Ralph Ford. And uh, uh, Ralph and Robert were the main band directors. Dr. Long had retired, but uh, they uh, I learned a lot from them. And we, I went through the music education program with uh, Dr. Uh, Orlovsky, and she was just fantastic. Uh, very practical, uh, very practical kind of gal. That's and she, like. yeah, 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 she was, everything was based on here's what you're going to do. You know, we, when we did our observations and all that stuff, she was, she enjoyed us doing observations where we were involved, where we did lesson plans, where we were part of what was going on in the class so to, you know, dip our feet in the pond to. Uh, um, so I interned in in the town of Troy at Charles Henderson High School with Michael Thomas. And that was the first time I got a taste of what a small school was going to be like, uh, because even though Troy State was there and had a huge band program, Pike County, which is where Troy is, is, is a small rural county. Um, so I, uh, I learned a little bit of what it was going to be like. Um, how big, how big was that band where, that you interned at? Probably a hundred, 110, probably a hundred, 110. Um, it was definitely 
a lot smaller than my the high school I went to, and then uh, definitely the Sound of the South. It was much smaller than that. Yeah. Um, and my my interning teacher, um, the, the guy I did my internship with, he was a very practical guy too, and he wasn't asking me to go get coffee. Good. He was putting me to work, um, which is what I do with interns also. So where'd you get your first job? Worth County High School in um, Sylvester, Georgia, the big town of Sylvester. And I was hired as the chorus director and the assistant band director. Hmm. Um, so I had to um, bone up on my choral techniques very quickly. And uh, they we hit the ground running. Uh, the, the head band director was new there that year, too. So we all were learning the town and learning uh, the different ins and outs of what we were doing there. And how, how big was that band? Uh, that band, that band again was a hundred, 110, a lot of times 90, um, just depending on the year. Yep. Okay. How long were you there? I was at Worth County for 10 years. Um, my, my sixth year of teaching there, um, I took over as the hand, the head band director. Um, the guy I was working with, uh, Jarrett Farrell, moved up to uh, LaGrange. Mm -hmm. um, so then I got to it, it was a good transition because I basically took what we already established and ran with it. Yep. So you were there 10 years. Where'd you go next? After that, I went to um, Doherty County. I taught at Radium Springs Middle School. Now, Doherty County, uh, this is the city of Albany we're talking about now. And Albany is urban, very urban. And most of my kids were from that. Now, still high poverty. We're yep. very high poverty, um, but er, it, definitely in the urban sitting setting. And how was, that, um, how was that switch to middle school as well? Well, as a, as a high school band director, I knew flat out that if I didn't get down there and see those kids in the middle school and work with them, yep. they weren't going to come to me in the high school. So I had some good middle school techniques down, but I developed, I did, developed a lot of them on the fly when I, when I took it over because in high school, you know, you look at a part that, that a say, you know, a second trumpet player is having a hard time with in class, you know, go over there and practice it till you get it right. You can't do that with the middle school. No. Um, so it was, you need to be more concrete. More absolutely yeah absolutely and um i had to really rein in some of the some of the you know some of the verbal quips and things i might have used with a high schooler yeah. not going to fly with with middle schoolers yeah uh, they take everything absolutely to heart so you've got to be very careful with that so how long were you in that job i was there for seven years um, I was there for seven years and, uh, and I also helped with the high schools there. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're the, if you're the middle school band director, you are the assistant director at one of the high schools. Um, so I was, um, I, I know everybody in Albany, everybody here knows me. Some of them interned with me. Um, so there it's a, it's a great, uh, line of communication we have here. And did you go to your current school after that? No, I was at Randolph Clay High School for two years uh, in Cuthbert, Georgia, and that was getting back very rural, yeah. very, very rural. And uh, they brought me in to bring back their band program also. And uh, one of one of the quickest things to do when you're starting, a lot of administrators don't understand that you can't fix 10 years of no band in three months. <laughs> so uh, when they're really adamant that you get product out there for the uh, townspeople and, and the football fans to see, the quickest thing to get together was the drum line. Yep. And uh, so we put together a drum line real fast to get out and play for the games um, while we were working on establishing the wins um, in class. So it was, um, it's always, always exciting. I, uh, I tell people when you take over a program that's been dormant for a while, 
it's like the airplane is already in the air and you're gluing the wings on trying to <laughs> trying to get it going um so <laughs> we did that i did that at randolph clay for two years and uh then i was in lee county for two years which is a little more affluent over here but they had they hired me i did chorus for two years there and it was um a very wonderful environment over there um i was not looking to leave uh, as a matter of fact um mitchell county reached out to me and uh the the vision that the the that the uh, principal had and the superintendent have for changing the culture at the school i found very compelling yep. so i'm down there and we we i i hit the road in june one i i touched down in mitchell county and i have been running ever since the, of um, this year of this year wow. yeah i took them over and um we put a an entire band on the field for the first time in 10 years oh good for you uh, yeah we it, it was amazing because we were walking in to the stands we hadn't played a note and people were thanking me and shaking my hand on the way in. Thank you for bringing the band back, which I was, you know, I was not prepared for. It's like, well, now we have to be good. Great. <laughs> 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 um, and that was that was another one of those those areas that, uh, you know, my admin had this. He has this great vision for what the band. OK. First game, we're going to be out in uniforms. We're going to have the shakos on. We're going to be on the field. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm looking at this list of stuff. Okay, well, we're going to make that happen one way or another. Um, but so, yeah. It, so you started June 1. When, yeah. So you were talking to me about getting kids in for the summer and what you had to do in this. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the town you're in now um, and the school and the size and, and all that and what you did to get started in such a small area. Well, um, we were very fortunate that there was a small core group of kids there that had been kind of keeping the band alive. They had done little pep bands over the years, and there was a group of them that just wanted to have it there. But how so many kids? Be, how many kids are you talking? We're talking eight. Eight, yeah. We're talking eight, and um, so. I got there and the the young man that was the um, band president, he had a list of kids that he had had, he, him and the administration had had an interest meeting. And they put together a list of all these kids that were in uh, 50 names of kids that were interested. So we started emailing them and we put a, up a Facebook page and um, we started seeing who was interested. And I, I got certified on the minibus huh. and I went to all points that you could imagine in this County to pick kids up, to bring them in. And this was not, this was not like a typical um, band camp. This, this was not that at all. This was getting them in and teaching them their instrument. Yep. Um, it how, far, how far did you have to drive for the furthest point out? Well, um, there have been points where I've taken kids back home after football games uh, where I will be an hour and a half delivering kids to all points in the county. Round um, trip. Round trip. Yeah. From the from the bus barn to dropping them off to coming back to the bus barn. We're talking an hour and a half a lot. Um the two the two furthest points between the kids that live the furthest out, we're talking a 45 minute transition yeah. between those two points. Well, um, yeah, and but you're showing right away when you're new in this position that your dedication to the kids and, and doing what you can for them. So that's got to be helping with the buy in, I would assume. It does. And it helps with um, your administrator's perception of what you're doing, um, because that is a concrete uh, thing you're doing that they can see. Um, a lot of what we do as band directors is dump behind doors. And, you know, it's, it's not a secret that a lot of administrators don't understand what we do and don't know what we do. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can do something that they can see right off the bat, um, you know, do it, absolutely do it. 
So um, did, was there a bunch of instruments there that you're able to use as these kids are jumping in? There were instruments there and uh, there were, they, we may do, yeah. we may do, we could get enough of them working where we could uh, go through essential elements and uh, start working from the beginning and, and keep going. Um, it, the, and we're still working with essential elements too, trying to bring the level of what we're going to be doing with the concert band up to. What's your are schedule? They novice? Are oh. they all, are the majority novice players? Like they've never played a horn before in their lives? The, the eight that were there were still at what I would consider to be a mid, middle school level. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I'm sixth or seventh grade. Um, and then the rest of the band that showed up um, because I, I would have maybe 12 kids every day and it may not be the same kids every day. Mm-hmm. It just depended on the day. Um, when school started, I had, you know, I had 30 more kids that I'd never seen before. And most of them are beginners. Yeah. So it was, uh, again, the airplane gluing the wings on. So, so tell us about your schedule. We're on block scheduling, um, which is, not my favorite thing to be on, but it's a four by four block. We have four blocks every day, 90 minutes a block. And I have three blocks of band classes and I have one block of planning. So how do the uh, kids, how do the kids schedule band throughout their four years? Are they able to? We, what we have going on right now is um, a lot of the kids are what I call half timers. They do half time. They do 45 minutes in one class and then they do 45 minutes in band. Yep. And that's how we, they, they basically have been double scheduled so we can get them in band. Um, the administration has been exceedingly accommodating for me. Whatever we need to do to get they to get them there, we've been doing. And um, and sometimes, you know, I came up with the idea. Sometimes they came up with the idea. Well, it's, uh, it's funny because sometimes people think that money is the number one thing. Now, obviously, like you need instruments, right? Yeah. But I think I think we'd probably all agree that time is really the number one factor. If you need time with the kids and that's that's number one. Right. So I know there's teachers out there who are in a schedule where they're I was there once, too, and I had to leave that job like after their freshman year, they cannot take band. So you find that they're taking it after school for two days a week for an hour, their normal concert band class, you know. And it's like that that's hard to build a program. So it's really great that your your admin, you know, clearly they went out and got you and now you have some pull as to how to make this thing go. Well, you know, when we were getting ready for the first game, um, we had all these kids doing halftime and we have several kids that aren't in the band class at all that just do after school rehearsals. So to get them all together, he let me for a couple weeks bring them all in on my planning period. Tuesdays and Thursdays mm. they they made up their work in their other classes and they came to me for those hours and a half and that's where we learned to do drill and and basics and all that good stuff um and so what, he, I apologize so when when do you rehearse after school and how often we do um Tuesdays and Thursdays and we go from three thirty to five o'clock um and the, now, those days, I don't run the minibus because it's not available. Um, at those points, the, the buses are running routes and all that all that stuff going on there. Um, and then Fridays, of course, are the games. Um, I, I, you know, Wednesday is church night, so we don't we don't we don't do rehearsals on on Wednesday. Um, and on the Tuesdays and Thursdays, we have seventh and eighth graders from the middle school that join us too. Um, they come onto the marching field with us all also. So how many kids do you feel total on the, from the marching band? About 50, about 50. Wow. That's so great. it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big change from eight. <laughs> and you have a- do you have guard as well, or you haven't gotten to that point yet? We have a dance line. Uh, the dance line had been established. Um, they had been going on even when the band wasn't. Um, they they would do they would do halftime with canned music coming in, um, but they were excited to have us back too 
Um, and the, yes, they come onto the field with us and do some routines to our music. Our halftime show right now, we come out in an M for Mitchell County and we play some songs. And uh, we have just gotten to the point now where we can march and play at the same time, um, which has been a paradigm leap for us mm -hmm. and which is good because the homecoming parade is tomorrow. So these these past few weeks, we have been working on getting feet moving and playing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are your what are your strategies for that when you have kids who are brand new at marching and getting their feet moving? Well, we we work on the marching first without any playing. Yep. Left, right, left. We have the snare drum doing the tap. And then the first thing I do with them playing, we just do the B flat concert scale as we're moving eight steps at a time. Um, we make it simple. And uh, so that, yeah, that's what I do first. Jeff and had an the, idea. We talked one time. Jeff used to use, a, what are they, a go-go bells? Yeah. And oh. he, he would use a high pitch on the left and a low pitch on the right or something to help those kids with the left, right. I even started these past couple of years with new marchers. I even started just, just having them keep the beat. Like, I don't even care if you're on the wrong foot to start, at least like feel the pulse and make sure you're in time. And then maybe a little bit down the road, we work on being on the correct foot. So I, I apologize for interrupting, but those are some no, that's, we've talked about it, in the past. I had to, um, and I mean, I had to teach the drummers how to do a tap. I mean, that's, that's, how new these guys, I mean, green, green, just do that, 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 that. We had to go, we had to break it down to that level of detail. I mean, it wasn't yet. Yeah, they've never done it before. There's no culture established. No, so you're establishing all of it. Yeah. None of, none of my drummers have been in band before. Wow. And so, did you ever consider, this might help you, when I had some kids because of different learning skills and everything, I would put a green dot on their left foot, on their left shoe. <laughs> I, I like that. Some kids don't know their left from the right. So we had everybody put a green dot on the top of their left foot so that the, with, with the younger kids, they could learn where left was. And you didn't have to say, go to put your left foot out. Green. <laughs> and then later, you, green you know what? I'm going to steal that from you now. You're welcome to steal it. <laughs> like all good teaching ideas. That's right. Yeah. But um, yeah, you, you're, you've got, you should be applauded. Did you do your own arrangements for marching band? Yes. Um, I, I write them specifically for what we can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. good um, yeah. There, it, you have to have music for the band you have, not for the one you want. Mm -hmm. right. And um that's so, a yeah. huge lesson. That's a huge lesson for a lot of people. They think, oh, we're a certain age. Here's our repertoire. It's like, no, what can they actually achieve? Well, in my in my composition, my compositional life um, it, with the pieces I get published and all, I kind of specialize in beginning and developing band anyway. Yeah. So doing arrangements, I, I know what I know what level they can do and I know what how to keep it to where they can play it. Um, cause it's the same thing I do when I write a concert piece to get published. Um, you, you know, there's a strict set of guidelines you've got to, you've got to live with. Um, and you know, over the years they'll get better and those, you know, those guidelines will open up and, you know, we'll have better range. We'll have better reading. Um, but for right now, you know, those, um, those, those walls are really close. Yeah. I was talking to a younger teacher earlier this week and we were talking about how to tell if a concert band piece is playable by your kids or not. Right. Like how, how do I know if this piece, if my kids can play it, even if you've been, maybe you're the second year in the job. Right. So like, can you walk somebody through that? Maybe who doesn't know? I mean, I think we're all experienced enough teachers that we can, we know where our kids are at. We can look at the piece and figure out if it's a good level for them. But what are some concrete ways that you do that? Well, when I look when I look at a piece, you know, of course, the publisher's idea of what a two is and my idea of what a two is often do not correlate. Um, so I'm looking at the piece. Is there are there melodic ideas in there that are based on the scales? Is it based on the first six notes that we played? You know, and I'm looking at this. Oh, wait, there's a D. Can my trumpets play a D in the staff? So I'm looking for all those things right to begin with. But the, you know, 
the, the proof really is when you do that sight read. Yep. Um, and, and that's another thing I tell my younger, younger directors that have interned with me. Um, the more you sight read, the better they will read. Um, but I'm looking for, I'm looking for those specific issues. The, the publishers put out guidelines to us for what they're looking for in specific grade levels. And I use those. I, you know, they're, they're very good guidelines. Um, it, it also works the other way too. You might have a band that you consider to be a grade, say it's a grade three band. And you hear this piece that's like a four and a half. I've done it before. And you're like, well, I really like this piece. And you look at the score you're like, my kids can actually play that. Like you think of every yeah. kid on their part. Like, I don't care if it's a four and a half, they can play it. Or it says it's a three. We can't touch that piece because of X, Y, and Z. So I think it's, you probably know your kids really well. Well, I'll tell you, um, I've talked to Robert W. Smith about this before. He calls his, he said his home is the house the Tempest built. And uh, in, in Georgia, the Tempest is a gift because it's on the two. Um, but it's got um, skill levels that are easily accessible to level one players. Um, so, yeah, we, we look for those two. Um, but yeah, I, I always look for the technical issues. Yeah. So do you have music for when the kids are on the field and then a different set of music for when the kids are in the stands? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I wrote a bunch of tunes out to begin with and what was going to go on the field and which ones were going to be on the stand changed from what I started with. Mm -hmm. Um I had a good idea of what I wanted on the field, but one of those songs I changed up. And right now with us not doing complicated drill or anything, I'm probably going to change it up again because there's another chart that I wrote out for them that they do exceedingly well that will be great on the field. And it's not a bad thing to, you know, mix it up for your audience every once in a while too. So you're doing flip folders and not having to memorize anything. No, they've memorized everything. Oh, good for you. They've memorized everything. Um, but that's also part of how am I arranging it for them? Mm -hmm. um, is it something that they can memorize? Yeah. So, yeah. For you, that's excellent. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, coming up here in a, in um, in part two, we're going to, uh, we're going to, Scott has given us three keys to building a rural band program. Clearly, you're only, what, four or five months in, and you're you're making a lot of headway in this program that you're at now. So I'm um, really looking forward to part two, um, some really concrete ways to build that rural program. So Scott, thanks for being here. And we're going to continue our conversation here in a minute. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.